Lecture 7, the distribution of sample means. So this is going to feel a lot like Lecture 6. And the only major difference is instead of doing one score, we're going to be doing a group of scores. So not that big of a jump. Okay. So in today's lecture, we're going to be talking about the def def definition, right, of what the definition of a distribution of sample means is. Um, we're going to describe uh, what, what it looks like by shape, how we can talk about it with expected value, standard error. Yes, because we are talking about a sample, there is a sampling error, that's okay. Uh, how to describe the location uh, by the sample mean, uh, the, by, by a z-score, that type of stuff. Um, also, uh, determining probabilities, like what's the probability of grabbing a sample mean uh, using a z-score um, and then our trusty unit normal table. So, okay. So some uh, kind of overreaching concepts, right? So location of a score in a sample or in a population can rep be represented by, by a z-score, right? So one score, uh, if I take the SAT, if I take the GRE, if I take an IQ test, right, I can get a score. And that score within a, within a sample, within a population, I can get a z-score, absolutely. And that's fine. And researchers usually want to look at more than just one score, right? So researchers typically want to look at entire samples, groups of people, 30, 60, 1,000, <laughs> 10,000, right, rather than single scores. So a sample provides an estimate of the population. It doesn't give us the entire picture of a population, but it gives us a much bigger um, idea or, you know, concept about a population versus just that one single score. So today we're really going to be looking at what are those procedures that we can be using that transform a sample mean, a, a group of scores, if you will, um, to a z-score. Okay, caution, um, sampling error, right? So a sample does provide an incomplete picture about a population. It's not the whole thing, right? And we've talked it at, not nauseam, but we've talked at length about, um, yes, we would love to use a population in all of our studies great. But there's some constraints there. Money, people, time, just it's resource heavy, right? Um, if we're looking at, I don't know, taking a look at, oh, we want to run a study on, does this, uh, does this new theory or this new methodology help increase GRE scores? Well, if I'm going to test the whole population, we're talking about thousands of people. That's very resource heavy. So we're going to be using a sample and that's okay. It's also going to yield an error, meaning there's going to be some natural discrepancy. That's also okay. The bulk of research out there is done on samples. It's fine. You're not messing up. Like it says here, right, it's a natural discrepancy. It's the amount of error between the sample statistic, right, so think back to lecture one, as a sample statistic, and its corresponding population parameter, PP. Right. So unless you are going to do the entire population, you're going to have some element of sampling error. Everybody knows that. That's OK. It doesn't mean that you that you messed up or you made a mistake. It just means that you are running a study on a sample, which, again, is the bulk of research. OK. Samples are going to vary. So say your your population is a thousand people and you first grab a, a sample of 15, and then you grab another 20, and then you grab a, you know, 50, and then you grab just five because it was a, it was a slow day that day. That's fine. The data that correlates with that, that sample, with those different sample groups, are going to vary. Humans are <laughs> diverse. That's what makes us fun and interesting in the social sciences to, to, to study, right? If we were all completely the same, it would be no fun or interesting to study. So that's, that's okay, right? Samples are going to vary. Um, it's very rare that your samples, like this sample group and this sample group, are identical. Okay, you're going to see this image reoccur quite a bit in this lecture uh, PowerPoint slide, and that's okay. Um, okay, so distribution of the sample means. So let's say that two separate samples are, you know, you grab two separate groups. Okay, obviously they're going to be different even though you take them from the same population. So look at this graph here, right? This is the distribution of, of sample means or your entire population group, okay? If you just randomly 
select one, I don't know, over on the right hand side towards the end of that tail, that group that you grabbed is going to have wildly different um, data points than if you just randomly selected a chunk of people or a chunk of data on the left hand side or one right in the middle. Okay, so given a random sample, it's unlikely the sample means would always be the same. Now, the distribution of sample means is the collection of the sample means for all the possible people, all the possible random samples, all the possible data points, all the possible groupings in that particular size, right, n, right, n being your sample size. That can be obtained from that population. Okay. And I love this graphic here, and you are going to see it um, repeated throughout this lecture, because what you can see here, again, it's the classic histogram, right? So that you have the bars, and the height of the bar corresponds to the frequency, or how often, or how many people in your group there, right, kind of showed that data point, or scored that score. Um, you'll notice that, yes, the mean peaks in the middle, right? So mean, median, mode, it's unimodal, it's symmetrical, all that stuff. Absolutely. The, the line is just kind of superimposed on top of it to kind of show that normal distribution. So the big takeaway is, even if you grab four samples, five samples, six samples, unless you're going to be sampling every single person, but then you'll be doing the population, you are going to have some sampling error, and that's okay. The distribution of sample means, after a while, is going to approximate the population. Okay. So again, previous distribution, previous use of that unit normal table, previous use of that z-score table that I gave you or that you have access to, were used to do one score, right? Scores from the samples. Okay. A sampling distribution is a distribution of statistics, not scores, right? And this is a special kind of population that we're looking at now. Okay, so the distribution of sample means is obtained by selecting all the possible samples, so groups after groups after groups after groups after groups, of specific sizes, your n, your, your, your sample size, from that population. Okay, so that's, like I said, when I started the lecture, this is going to feel a lot like the previous lecture in lecture six, right? Um, just trying to find the z-score for one score. That's the same thing with distribution of sample means. We're just now finding it for groups of scores. And I'm still going to approximate that, that population mean or mu. Okay, here's that graph again. <laughs> yes, the sample mean should pile up around the population mean because, yes, there is a sampling error. And you really should be trying to get an authentic sample pull. You shouldn't be cherry picking. You shouldn't be going after people that you think will be more or less likely to right, be very, I don't know, fall victim to your treatment effect or anything like that, right? No, you should be just going after what you believe is a sample of that population. So if you're looking for, I don't know, if you're looking for does cognitive behavioral therapy um, decrease rates of depression or anxiety or whatever you're looking for in um, high school, juniors and seniors, so looking at upperclassmen, okay? Well, then that's your population, so your sample should be a cross-section of that. You should be looking at, um, you know, all genders. You should be looking at different ethnicities. You should be looking at different socioeconomic status. You should be looking at people in Wisconsin and Florida and California and Arizona, everybody, right? Um, you should be looking at really upperclassmen that are way ahead of schedule, those 12 and 13 year olds, usually upperclassmen that are maybe got retained a couple of years, right? You should be looking at upperclassmen that are um, in detention and, and or being incarcerated and you should be looking at the upperclassmen that are homeschooled, right? Whatever you want to determine your, your population be, that sample pool that, that, that in your group should be a true cross section. So yes, do a cr true cross section and you're still gonna have sampling error. And if you do so, that sample mean should pile up around the population mean, right? It should approximate the mean in almost every way, knowing there's going to be a little bit of error because it's a sample, okay? The distribution of the sample mean is approximately also normal in shape. Because it's approximately normal in shape, you can use the unit normal table because we can't use a unit normal table or that Z table if it's skewed, 
right? If it's positively skewed or negatively skewed, you can't use that normal table. But because we're doing an authentic sample pull, it's approximating the mean of a population, so it is approximating a normal shape. And the larger the sample size, the closer it is going to look like a population, okay? So getting a sample pool of like five, probably not a great idea. 15, better. Now, it's gonna sound a little low, <laughs> but in statistics, the golden rule is 30. If you can get a really good cross-section, authentic sample of 30 people, that approximates the population mu. Isn't that wild? Now, yes, I know, larger is always better, but larger also costs a lot of money. Larger is also keeping up with a lot of people. <laughs> so logistically, it's harder. 30 is a good number. Okay, so again, I know this looks like there's more than two here. Yes, total number, yes. But again, we're not dealing with just raw scores. We're not dealing with one person. We're dealing with distribution of sample means. Right? So in this case, our number is two. That means we're dealing with two groups. And again, I just love that graph down there at the bottom of 10 corners. So I just put it in there again, showing the approximation of the sample mean looking like the population mu if you get that authentic sample pull. Okay. Oh, I should have given less like a, I don't know, like a drum roll. Right. Okay. Central limit theorem. Okay, so in statistics, you're going to hear a lot about central limit theorem. It's one of our like golden, I don't know, concepts. Okay, so I'll start left hand side first. So it is possible to determine exactly what the distribution of sample means looks like without taking hundreds and hundreds, even thousands of samples, because we have this theorem, this proof, like most mathematical and scientific disciplines do, right? And this one is called the central limit theorem. Okay. The central limit theorem is used to specify the shape, the central tendency, and the variability of the distribution of sample means. These are all concepts we've already talked about in previous lectures, right? So the shape is that normal distribution, that perfect bell curve, if you will. Central tendency, where where is the scores piling up at? Where are the scores piling up, right? right? Where are the bulk of the scores at? Where's, where are those tails at? Variability. Are the scores all over the place, right? Or are they kind of clustered together? Okay. The central limit theorem tells us that, right? We can use the central limit theorem to kind of give us that, that sneak peek into our, our distribution of sample means. Okay, so let's dig into a little bit deeper. So yes, far left-hand side, there's your equation. All right, so it's our little curly Q, or a circle with a curly Q, so standard deviation, divided by the square root of whatever your sample size is. Okay, so the central lim limit theorem can apply to any population with a mean, so you have to have like, a, like an average, and standard deviation, so you have to have those two. The distribution of sample mean approaches a normal distribution as the sample size approaches infinity. Sure, but 30 is our golden number. <laughs> okay. And larger is always number, or always better. Okay. The distribution of sample means for sample size of n will have a mean of whatever that population mu is. Meaning, as long as you are doing an authentic sample pool. Okay, the size of your sample, around 30, will make it so that your standard deviation, your, your shape, your um, mean, will approximate what that population is. That's the power of the central limit theorem. And the distribution of the sample means, right, for the sample size of n, around 30, but again, it can be anything, will have a standard deviation of, again, around whatever that population is. That's, again, the power of the central limit theorem. It's amazing. Okay. The distribution of the sample means is almost perfectly normal in either 
of these two conditions. So it has to meet one of these two. It doesn't have to meet both. It just has to meet one of the two. Okay. Number one, and this is the harder of the two, but it's okay. The population from which the samples are selected, you know, is normally distributed. Okay. Meaning we have done so many studies on this particular topic. It's known. Okay. So some of the examples I've already gone over in a lot of these lectures, things like IQ, SAT, blood pressure, um, GRE scores, that type of stuff. Okay. So we've done so many studies, so many experiments have been ran on these types of concepts. We know what the normal distribution is. We know that if we pull a sample and we run it against that concept, we're running against a normal distribution. Sometimes we don't know that though. What if we're running a study on something that's brand new, cutting edge technology, cutting edge therapy, something that's very innovative, okay? We need to get our sample size relatively large. <laughs> and I put relatively in there on purpose. Relative meaning close to 30. 32 is great. 35, amazing. <laughs> okay. I know you don't think 30 is large. 30 is a lot. Th keeping track of 30 humans is a big undertaking. Okay. Because trying to keep track of 30 humans over, I don't know, a three week period, a six month time span, <laughs> a year, it takes a lot. <laughs> it takes so much effort, time, money, manpower, right? And we've run this enough that we know that if you get to 30, it does approximate the mu, the population average. So, which is good because run your first test or run your first experiment, you'll notice 30 is a lot to keep up with. I know it doesn't sound like a very large number, but it is. Okay. So the mean of a distribution sample. Okay, expected value of the mean. The short answer is the population mu, but we'll go through all these. Okay, so the mean of the distribution of the sample means is the mu or the average of the, um, of the population or the mean, okay. It has the value equal to the mean of the population of the scores, the mu. Meaning, as long as you are doing an authentic sample pool, your sample approximate your population. So whatever your population mu is, your sample mean is. The mean of the distribution of sample means is called the expected value of mean. That's the only caveat you have to make. Mean is considered an unbiased statistic because mu mean, the expected value of the distribution of the sample means is the value of the population mean shorthand or mathematical Greek letter mu. Okay. Again, and I'll start this slide that how I, how I, or I'll finish the slide how I started it. As long as you're doing authentic sample poll, you are really, you're not cherry picking, you're not going after people that you think are going to be very vulnerable or not vulnerable at all to your treatment. You're getting around 30 people for your set, for your study, your, your sample size, is good, right? Your sample is going to approximate your population. Okay. So your sample mean is going to be expected to approximate your population mu. The expected value of mean is your population mu. And we just write that with mu m. Okay, some slides on standard error. I know we touched on this just a little bit. The standard error of mean measures how well an individual sample mean, and again, when we say individual sample mean, we're saying that that group that you pulled represents the entire distribution. We're not talking about one score. We're talking about an individual sample mean. I know it sounds like I'm saying an individual sample, but I'm not. Not an individual score. 
an individual sample mean. Okay. The variability of a distribution, so how all over the place the scores are, is measured by the standard deviation. Remember how a few lectures ago we're like, yes, we love variability, and we just kind of use variability to get to our standard deviation? Same premise still holds here. Okay. The variability of a, of a distribution of a sample means is measured by the standard deviation of the sample means. Shorthand is just called standard error of mean. Mathematically, it's written um, sigma sub m, right? So it's a standard deviation, so a, um, like an O with a curly Q on top. So again, uh, in America, we use Greek letters and statistics to uh, notate what we're talking about. So um, standard deviation, so the circle with a curly Q on top, so the Greek letter sigma, and then right underneath it, like if so if we're writing on a number line, so the if the paper had like a line on it, the sigma would be on top of the number of the line, and the m would be below the line. Okay, so be mathematically how we would write standard error of the mean. It's okay. It does not mean we're messing up. Okay. Second point. The standard error of mean is the standard deviation. How much does it deviate? How much does it go away from? the standard distribution of all the sample means. Okay, When that standard error is very large, it means those groups of scores, those, um, all those individual like sample means are all over the place. It means that you are studying something very wild. If that, and the opposite, all right, if that standard error of the mean is very small, it means that you are studying something very tightly clustered together. Okay. The standard error of mean provides a measure of how much distance is expected between the sampling error, or sampling average, M, capital M, and the population average, mu. Say that again because I kind of stumbled it, sorry. <laughs> the standard error of mean provides a measure, like a quantifiable measurement, of how much distance, how far away, right, is expected on average between the sampling average and the population average. Third point, law of large numbers. The larger the sample size, n, the more probable it is that that sample mean will be close to the population mean. So go with me on this. If my population is 100, we have a very small population about something, okay, and I grab a group of people of 10, I'm gonna have a pretty large sampling error, probably. If I grab 10 more and now my sample is 20, my sampling error is probably going to go down. It will go down. If I grab 10 more, now I have 30, my sampling error is going to go down, even more so. If I grab 10 more, 40, 10 more, 50, 10 more, 60, it's going to go down, down, down. The larger the sample size, the more probable it is that sample mean will be close to the population mean until the point that I get to 100 out of 100. Now that sample mean is exactly this, the population mean because I've grabbed everybody. Okay, population variance. The smaller the variance in the population, so the smaller the scores all, all over the place, the, the more probable it is the sample will be close to the population mean because that sample poll I'm going to do is also going to have small variance. It can't have a large variance. Okay. If you think about the population like the parent and the sample like the child, if the population doesn't swing wildly, there's no way the child can swing wildly. This is taking a look at the relationship between the standard error 
and the sample size. This is just a different way to look at it. This is a, a graphic way to look at it. Meaning, as the sample size increases, the standard error decreases. Again, the y-axis, that up and down one is the frequency. The x-axis, that right to left one, is the, is the scores, right? So we have standard deviation of 10. As the sample size increases, there's less error between the sample mean and the population mean, right? And after a while, you're going to keep grabbing people out of the population until your sample size equals your population, and you're going to have zero standard error because you have everybody have the population in your sample. Right? Okay, take a look at this one. This one's a little bit trippy, but I like it. Okay, part A. So start at the top, and then we're gonna go counterclockwise. Okay, so part A shows the population of reading scores. Okay, so we have average score of 100, we have standard deviation of 12. Okay, this is just reading scores. Okay. And then we grab 16 people out of this population. Okay, and their scores, and uh, remember, the average, the whole population is 100. In our sample pool, we had 16, and their scores were 82, 84, we had two people that had 92, then we had one person with 93, two people with 95, then we had a 97, 9, 98, and then 99, 100. And now we're crossing that, that average, right? So now we have 102, 110, two people with 113, and one person that blew a 115. Okay, so from this sample pool of 16, their mean, their average, was 98.75, so slightly below. That's fine, with a standard deviation of 9.88. See how it, like, it approximates the population? Okay, part C, the bottom part. Shows the distribution of sample means for all the possible samples of those 16 reading scores. Do you see how the variability got tighter? Right? See how in the population it's like very like flat. <laughs> it's like and then when you took a sample of it, <laughs> right? The variability had to get tighter because the sample size is so much smaller. And it says, please note, the mean for the sample in part B is one of thousands of sample means in that original population. So I could go back up to A, right? So if I finish my counterclockwise rotation, I could go back up and I could pull a different sample of 16, but maybe for some reason I pulled it and it was like on the far right-hand side of that tail, right? Far right-hand side. And I pulled one that, I don't know, had a score of like 116, 172, one, you know, it's like crazy tail, right? And it could either have, so the, the mean might be now, I don't know, 114 or whatever, right? The shape might look a little bit different, which is fine. And if I did that for every single sample pull, after a while, it would look like that original one again. So the primary use for distribution of sample means is to find the probability of selecting that sample within whatever kind of specific mean you're looking for. Okay. The proportions of the normal curve are used to represent probabilities, and that's where your z-table comes in. Right? So a z-score for the sample mean can be computed just like a z-score for your one individual raw score can be computed. That's what I'm saying. The function, the flow, the feel of this lecture should feel a lot like le last lecture. The only difference is now we're talking about like a group of scores, sample means versus a raw score. But the whole function of this lecture is the same function of last le lecture, right? How can I find the probability of just putting my hand in a bucket and pulling out this score? So, same equation, slightly different, okay. So remember how it was like z equals mean minus mu divided by standard deviation? The only difference now is z equals mean minus mu divided by standard deviation of 
the mean. Okay, same thing though. The sign tells you whether the location is above or below the mean. So if you run this equation and your z-score is plus 3.2 or minus 1.7, right? A plus sign is gonna tell you you scored above the mean, which doesn't necessarily mean it's good or bad, just means you're above the mean. A z-score of negative 1.7 means you scored below the mean. Again, doesn't mean good or bad, just means you're below the mean. The number tells you the distance from the mean, right? Think about like miles. I'm one mile away, I'm three miles away, okay? This is just showing you the distribution of sample means for n equaling 16, standard deviation 25, standard deviation of mean, um, and the average score of 500. I can, just like I did with a raw score, convert the mean to z-scores. When I convert the mean to a z-score, my mean, or my mu, that was 500 is now zero. My standard deviation that was chunks of 25, right, 25, 25, 25, is now increments of one on both sides. So one standard deviation above the mean used to take me from 500 to 525. Two standard deviations above the mean used to take me from 500 to 550. Now it takes me from zero to one, from zero to two, right? Same thing on the left-hand side. It used to take me from 500 to 475. Now it takes me from zero to negative one, zero to negative two, same feel. Instead of one raw score, we're now dealing with a group of scores. Same thing here. You can count the probability of randomly selecting a group of scores in the middle. Do you remember which column you're going to use for this one? It's not B, it's not C, it's D. All right. This one now is the median, and then find median to the negative, median to the positive, and atom. So this is the middle 80% of the distribution. Sample score or sample means of, for, yeah, 25 scores. Okay, one last thing about standard error. <laughs> um, absolutely, there's a discrepancy between the sample mean and the population mean. If that drives you nuts, I don't know what to tell you. You're gonna have to, I'll tell you, tell you nicely. You're gonna have to get over it. <laughs> You're gonna have to get over it. It's just called a sampling error, it's fine. The amount of sampling error is going to vary across samples, but you're always going to have it. The variability of the sampling error is measured by the standard error of the mean. And again, unless you're doing a, a research study and you're using population, you're always going to have sampling error. Um, I know I've hit this one at nauseum. The bars and the histogram represent frequencies. That red line is just superimposed on the histogram. The expected value of the distribution always equals the population mean. So this is just, again, showing the shape of the different sample mean is gonna change depending on several things. What was your sample pool, right? What was the variability of that sample pool? And if you pull enough of those, it will start approximating the normal distribution. Okay, so in A, you pulled one. <laughs> great, that's a great pull, awesome. You had one. Um, and the standard deviation is going to be 20, awesome. And then in the next one, you had four standard deviation of, or sa sorry, sample mean, standard deviation of the sample mean is 10. Um, it starts to tighten up and then um, 100, tighten up even more, right? And if you notice the, si the size, the standard error decreases, the sample size increases. Again, it's going to do that until you get to the population and then after a while, you will not have a standard error because you did everybody. Okay, really quick, I want to talk about how they reported in like academic articles. Um, if you're gonna like present at a conference, uh, normally you just do standard error as SE. Sometimes a little bit older articles will use SEM. So standard error is just SE, capital S, capital E. Um, 
usually you're gonna see it reported along with it, like the sample size and the average or the mean for the different groups in the experiment. So um, I have a couple different examples here on the left-hand side. Um, so if you're looking at, yeah, plus or minus, and you, you always have like the score and then the SE, right? So you have um, some whisker plot, right, right? So you have A and B there. I don't know. I just thought you'd like that. You're not going to be tested on it or not going to be reviewed on it. I just thought you'd like to see it. Okay, moving forward. Again, inferential statistics uses sample data as basis for drawing general conclusions about a population. The sample information is not perfectly accurate reflection of the population. The sampling error, and it's okay. <laughs> there is a natural di difference between the samples and the population. Again, it's okay. <laughs> This does introduce a degree of uncertainty and error in all inferential statistics um, processes, and it's okay. <laughs> uh, I love inferential statistics. I love being able to take a look at groups of people and say, I wonder what the probability of pulling them from the population is. Did this happen by hap happenstance, or was this uh, because the treatment effect um, because both answers to those questions are, are interesting and intriguing. Okay. One last uh, show here is the purpose uh, of this study was to show whether the treatment uh, growth hormone had an effect on weight of rats, right? And so um, we, we have a normal uh, distribution here. We have, uh, what did we do, 25 rats, and the average was, uh, or the mean was 40, or 400, sorry, with a standard deviation of 20. We did the treatment. And then, um, yeah, take a look at it and you say, okay, well, so this would be like a real life study on, yeah, growth hormones. And so you would say, well, after the experiment, then take a look at those 25 rats. If those 25 rats were statistically significantly larger, right, because it's a growth hormone, depending on your alpha level, you could affect, say, I'm 95% or 99% sure that these 95 rats are bigger because of this treatment effect. It's pretty powerful. And then you say, okay, give me another 25 rats, maybe 50 rats. And you keep doing that. And if you can replicate it enough, then you say, okay, let's, let's move on um, to a higher form of life. And then after a while, you can put that to, to humans and because what you're doing is you're saying it's not the food they're eating, it's not the environment they're in, it's this specific independent variable that, that I, the researcher, had a, had a hypothesis about and tested um, and then can prove. <laughs>